Hey everybody, welcome to part two of my video series for Raid and Trade by Mage Company. Now in the second video, I'm going to teach you actually how to play the game of Raid and Trade. Now if you've already read the rules and you're not interested in learning how to play the game, you can skip this video and move over to my sample gameplay video where I'm going to show you what the game looks like when it's played, or you just completely bypass that and check out my review video where I'll give you my final opinions of Raid and Trade. Now Raid and Trade is a post-apocalyptic game. Basically World War III has happened and most of the world has been devastated except for a few last bastions of society called Golden Cities. And all of our players are competitively competing to gain access into the Golden City. Now there's three different ways to gain access to the Golden City. The first way you can do it is by completing three quests. The first person to complete three quests instantly gains access and instantly wins the game. The second way you can do it is by showing that you are a skilled member of society and worth letting into the Golden City. And you simply do that by completing various different inventions and proving how skilled of a member of society you can potentially be showing that you're very skilled getting to 20 skill points and then instantly winning the game the final way that you can gain access into the golden city is just by proving that you're a paragon of modern society doing lots of good deeds including not raiding buildings when you're being watched going over to the outpost and performing various tasks for the outpost to gain bonus reputation so you can become a better member of society and win the game in this video, I'm going to show you how to play the basic rules for Raid and Trade. Now, Raid and Trade is a very thematic game and actually comes with a different couple different game modes when you play the game. You're seeing the basic layout right here right now, but on the opposite side of all these tiles, you're going to see a wasteland that's going to have slightly different rules on how you play the game. And there's also a scenario, which is for four to five players only, involving a race between all the players trying to race to get to the final tile, which has a helicopter on it. They're racing to build the helicopter while they're defeating all the guards so they can fix the helicopter and fly away. Interesting thing about this scenario though is that's for four to five players and only three players can make it on the helicopter and they're all racing to see who can be the last man standing while they're trying to avoid fighting all these guards who want to stop you from flying away on this helicopter. So again, these are different scenarios that come with the game. I'm not going to show you how to play with those different scenarios. I'm just going to show you the very basic rules, showing the standard layout, not using the wasteland tiles and showing you exactly how the basic game plays using the basic rules only. At the start of the game, you basically need to see the board after you make a couple different decisions before you can even start playing the game. First thing you do is you need to figure out exactly how many players you're playing with, and then every single player needs to get one of these player boards. Now, every one of these players plays ever so slightly differently because they have access to a different die, which is unique to them. And you can tell which die goes to which player because they're color-coded. There's a little zigzag bar that goes to the die. For example, you have the red die that goes with a red player, which happens to be Jake. You have the green die, which goes with the green player, which happens to be Zoe. And that happens to go for all the characters in the game. Every single one of these players also has a deck of unique inventions that only they can build. Now, they either have a difference of four different ones or five different ones, again, depending on which player you're playing. And they all have various costs to build. They're going to give you various different rewards when you build them, but they're all basically different for every one of the players. For example, Carter, who's a former law enforcement, has much more offensive items that he can create, such as guns and armor. And then you have Garcia, who's more of a trader. So more of the things he can build are more about trading with player and gaining skill points in those aspects. And matter of fact, he's also the best trader in the game. He actually has a free ability that only he has. I'll explain that to you when we get to the point about describing trading, but just to let you know that every one of these players, they are all asymmetric and they all play slightly differently. Once every player has their starting cards, their starting die, and their starting player board, they need to set all these boards to various different amounts. Now you notice that there's three dials in every one of these player boards. There's a green dial, which is your action points. There's a blue dial, which is your skills. And there's a yellow and red dial, which shows how much fame and favor you have with the Golden City. More into the yellow or the goldish color shows that you're doing good. More into the red or into the black list shows that you're not doing so good with the Golden City and they're not very happy with you. And as a matter of fact, if your faction gets too far into the negative, it's going to stop you from raiding because the people of the Golden City who are sending out the patrols are going to have a very keen eye out for you, stopping you from raiding the smaller buildings and gaining access to the smaller, easier hits because they're going to be watching out for you. So at the start of the game, every single player needs to start their favorite track at zero. Then you start their skill track also at zero. And then every single player needs to set their action point dial to number 15. And that's going to be done for every single player. And then every single player is going to put their matching miniature on the board on the center tile. But before you do that, you need to build the board. 
And again, this is a very modular game. All these boards have to be set out and they have to be laid out in a very specific order, meaning they have to connect, but you can actually lay out these tiles any way you want. There's actually extra rules in the game that allow you to make different layouts and different ways of playing the game. And matter of fact, when you play the helicopter scenario, it's not a three by three gear. It's actually set up completely different. It's actually a path players have to go on in an effort to make it to the final helicopter and try to win that specific scenario. Every one of these boards is going to have a way that has to be laid out because it has to be connected logically to the next board, but they can be set out any way you want. The only restriction is that the trader house, the trading house, has to be the center tile. Now you notice every one of these tiles on their top and bottom has one exit road from them, and their right and their left has two exit roads going from them. So when you're laying out these boards, you just need to make sure that you match that perfectly. So this only has one exit, so it has to connect to a single exit. This side has two exits, so it has to connect to a board with two exits. This side only has one exit, so again, it has to connect to one exit. So as long as you're putting the boards together in that legal fashion, you're perfectly fine. After you've done that, you need to pick one of these tiles right here, which is going to show you what kind of trades the trading house has available to it. But this is going to be randomly chosen, and you can play with these. They do make the game a little more difficult, or you can play without these. It's up to you. I suggest you play with them because they do add a little more variety and add a little bit more decisions to the game. Once you've randomly picked one of these, and they are double-sided, each side has slightly different trade goods that the trade house will accept, you're simply going to place it on the center of the board, and then the other three tiles are going to be removed from the game. Now what this does, this tells you what kind of resources are available to be traded for in the center trade house, and what kind of trade value they have. Now I'll explain resources in just a minute. There's eight different resources players are going to get by raiding all these buildings. But basically, if you're not having luck getting the resources you need from raiding these buildings, you can always go into the trading house and trade any four resources that you have in your own personal supply for one of the resources that are available in the trading house. Now, when you play without these discs right here, all eight resources are available to be traded for. But when you tra play with these trade discs right here, they're going to limit the amount of resources that can be traded for. So when you play for this in this scenario, in this situation, we said only the purple, the red, the green, and the yellow resources can be traded for. You can trade any resource you want to it, but these are the only four resources you can ever get back. After you built a map, you basically need to seed the map with all the buildings that can be raided to gain all these supplies. Now there's a couple different ways you can seed the map, but basically there's three different sizes of buildings. You have a small building, which is one of these green buildings. You have a medium sized building, which is a yellow building, and finally you have a red building, which is the largest size building. Now, there's a couple different ways you can do it. You can just randomly seed the map in wherever the buildings land. They happen to land if that's what you want. Or you can do what I like to do is I like to put the smaller buildings in the center, then randomly do everything around the outside. Or you can just basically pick one tile, do small, medium, large, small, medium, large, small, medium, large, and whatever you want to do. But basically, you need to seed the entire board. There's only one caveat to this, though, when you're seeding the board. You're going to have some boards that are going to have numbers such as the number 5 and the number 4. That means that those locations are only going to get buildings if you happen to have that many players. So if you happen to only have a 3 player game, you're only going to put buildings in the squares that have no numbers inside them. If you have a 4 player game, you're going to put buildings in all the squares that have no number and all the four number 4 size buildings. And again, if you have a 5 player game, you're basically going to put one of these buildings in every single square on the board except for one final square that's going to be left available in the three, four, or five player game. That one final square that's left available at the end of the, end of the setup is the building or where you're going to put the outpost building and add that building to the board. Now there's one other thing you need to realize about this game when you're setting up for the various player counts. When you're setting the game up for a three player game, the amount of these buildings is going to be based on however many players you have playing the game. And it's the amount of players times a certain number. So for the red buildings, you're going to have the amount of players times two is how many red buildings you're going to have. So in a five-player game, you're going to have ten of these red buildings. In a two, or I'm sorry, in a three-player game, you're only going to have six of these buildings. Now for the yellow buildings, you're going to have three times the amount of players. So in a three-player game, you're only going to have nine yellow buildings. In a five-player game, you're going to have 15 of these buildings. And then finally, for the small, the green buildings, you're going to have five times the amount of players. So in a five-player game, there's going to be 25 of them. In a three-player game, there's only going to be 15 of them. Now that goes only for the basic map, which I'm showing you how to set up now. When you flip the map tiles over and you play with the wasteland tiles, it's actually a different ratio of those buildings. 
But don't worry, both those ratios or tables are listed right in the rule book. I'm just telling you what the math is if you ever want to remember it. So you remember how to set up the board every time you play it. After you set up the player boards, all the players are going to start with the miniatures in the center of the board. Then you're basically going to shuffle the small building cards, the medium cards, and the large cards. You're going to shuffle all up the incident cards. You're going to randomly draw three starting quests that are going to start face up at the start of the game. Then you're going to randomly draw two global events that are going to start face up at the start of the game. After that, the entire game is completely set up. You just have to put all the resources that you can get from raiding all these buildings inside the bag so the players don't know what resources they're gaining. But I've left all of them out here just to show you what they are. But again, all the resources are placed in the bag. I just left these out because I'm going to explain them to you in just a moment. You'll notice that there's eight different resources available in the game, and these are all color-coded. Now, while some of them may have different kind of pictures on them, they basically have the same effect. So all the yellow resources is clothing. All this purplish color resources, those are all food. All the gray resources are weapons. You're going to use them. Even though it shows bullets, it's still a weapon. Some will show guns, some will show bullets, but they can still be discarded as a weapon. All the white ones happen to be tools, red happens to be medicine, etc. But those are all the different resources that you're going to get in the game. And again, all these resources are going to start in the bag at the start of the game. The only trick here is that food can be discarded at any time. And when food is discarded, each food that you discard and put back in the bag is going to be able to use to gain you action points. And any weapon that you discard, you can either use to build things or you can use those weapons to fight other players or to use them to defend yourself when other players happen to be attacking you because you're making yourself a wonderful target with lots of supplies that they want to come and take from you. On a player's turn, there's two things that they can do. They can do a move and then do an action, or if they want, they can do in reverse order. They can do an action and then a move, or if they want to, they can just simply do a move or simply do an action. Neither one of those things is mandatory and the order is not mandatory, but the only important thing to remember is that you can only do a move and you can only do one of four different actions. Now, if you ever forget what the actions are, they're all listed on every single player's player board. The first action you do is you can raid one of these buildings. Next thing you do is you can go into combat with another player who happens to be on the same tile as you. And I'll explain some other restrictions when we get there. The next thing you can do is you can craft one of the special items that only you're allowed to make. And again, every player has their own special unique items they can craft. The next thing you can do is you can perform a trade with another player. Now, you can only trade if it's your turn. Other players are not allowed to trade during some other player's turn. So if it's your turn, you're allowed to perform a trade with any other player playing the game. And then the final thing you can do is you can head on over to the outpost and you can go to work for the outpost where you do things such as earning some credits, which will give you some extra fame, or you can do ways to go out there and try to improve your fame naturally without relying on credits to buy your way in to the Golden City. Raid and trade is played out over rounds and on every single round, one player, like I said, gets the option to do one move and then one action. And the next player in order gets to do the same and players are going to continue doing this until they decide to pass. Once a player has decided to pass, they can't take any more actions, but they can always still defend themselves as long as they still have action points left over to pay for any one of those actions, such as defending yourself, or if they want to activate any cards, such as any quests they've managed to complete, or if they happen to have any encounter cards that they happen to have in their hand that they want to activate, they can go ahead and do that, but they're no longer do movement, once they pass, they no longer do any one of the four actions once they pass, except for trading if another player decides to initiate a trade with them. They're more than welcome to trade. They just cannot initiate any more trades once they've decided to pass. Now, every single round is going to start at the beginning. We're going to figure out who the first player is. And the first player of every single round is going to be based on whoever has the least amount of resources. Now, remember, all the resources happen to be in this bag. And it's not the power of the resources, it's just the total amount of resource tokens you have. Whoever has the least amount of resource tokens is going to be the starting player for the new round. Now the first thing the starting player needs to do is they need to decide which global event is going to go into effect for this entire round. So basically the starting player picks up the two face-up global event cards. They need to look at both these global event cards and they're going to decide and they are the only ones who gets to make the decision. Of course the other players can try to control them into making a decision. But it's up to them to make the decision. They're going to decide which one of these global events is going to go into play for this entire round and which one of these global events is going to be discarded and removed from the game until it possibly we go through all these global event cards and we're going to shuffle up the deck and start all over again. But once a global event has been chosen, it's going to be a global event for the entire round. It's going to affect all the players and every one of these global events are going to tell you exactly what they're going to do for the entire round. 
Some of them will stop players from doing rage for that round. Some of them will force all the players to get attacked by roving bands of thugs. And some will just make it so that nobody can fight each other or even do raiding during that entire round. So you basically need to look at all these cards and figure out which one of these of the two face up is going to help you the most and hurt the other players the most and go ahead and go with that decision. Once the player has made that decision, it's now time for the player to start the round and start their actions. Now again, the very first thing you can do on your turn is you can move and then perform an action or you perform one of the four actions and then moving. We'll go ahead and look at moving first. When a player decides to move, they're going to spend action points based on exactly how they want to move and where they're moving across the board. Now you notice that every single one of these boards, they all have roads on them and the players are going to use these roads to move around the board and interact with all the other players and interact with all these buildings that they want to raid. Now every one of these road sections, if a player wants to move, they're free to move anywhere along these road sections as long as they don't cross a barrier, and these are all listed in red, or as long as they don't jump from one tile onto another tile. So for example, if I'm using Garcia and I happen to be the Garcia player here, I'm free to move in front of this building right here without spending any movement or any movement for my actions. Let me go ahead and grab Garcia. If I move in front of this building right here, since I haven't crossed a barricade or left the tile, I'm not moving, using any of my actions or any of my movement points to move. Or if I even move in front of one of these two buildings and decide to raid them, again, I have not performed any movement. The moment I decide to leave the tile I'm currently on and move over to another tile, I need to spend one action point for my movement, and that's going to cost me the movement to move to that tile. If I decide to move back to the tile I just left, I'm free to do so by spending another action point, and there's good reasons to do that. I'll explain that in just a second. And any time I cross one of these barricades, even if I happen to stay on the same tile, I'm still going to spend one action point. Now you have to be careful about how you move across these tiles because these tiles are built like a realistic futuristic world that's been destroyed. So for example, this large overpass right here, I don't have the ability to fly, I'm not a mutant with wings, I don't have a super duper Legend of Zelda grappling hook that's going to allow me to get up across on top of this bridge. So you're going to see these wavy yellow lines letting you know that these are basically one way direction paths and that can affect how things are depending on how the board has been laid out. So Garcia is free to go underneath this bridge without using any movement points because he's not crossing any barricades. But he can't actually get on top of this bridge or if he happens to be on top of the bridge, he can't actually jump down, jumping across off the bridge without breaking his leg and dying. So he can't jump down so he basically has to get off the bridge and start moving around to get to some of these other buildings. So again to do movement is basically one action point to cross a barrier, one additional point to leave a tile, and you can move as far as you want, as far as you want, as long as you have the action points to spend. And for every square or every tile you leave is going to be one action point, And every barrier you're going to cross is going to be one action point. Now I said earlier you can move a lot. Now why would you want to do that? Well the reason why you want to do that is every time you enter a new tile that currently does not have an event card on it, you're going to flip over the top event card and lay down that tile. Now if you can afford to pay the resources for this card, you can simply add this card to your hand and players allowed to have up to five of these at the end of their turn so they pay for this card by spending the resources and add this card to this hand and then they can use this card at any time they want. Now some of these cards are going to have a fireball on them and that does mean it's a one time use card so after you pay the resource cost for the card and add it to your hand you can use it any time but when you do if it has a fireball symbol it's basically going to be discarded and that goes for even the player's special ability cards such as a super gun right here you see that once I build the super gun if I'm playing Carter once I use it, I'm going to discard it because it does have that fireball symbol. That does mean it's a one-time use card. But every time you enter a new tile, again, as long as there's no event card current on that tile, you're going to flip over the top event card and lay down that tile. If you can pay the resource cost for that, tile, or that card, you're going to add that card into your hand. If you can't pay the resource cost, that card is going to lay down on the tile. But again, as long as there's currently no incident card currently on the tile, as soon as a player enters that tile, an incident card is going to be drawn instantly and they have the choice to pay for it or not. So as I keep moving across the board, I'm going to keep adding instant cards. And I can either pay for them as I go, or if I can't afford them, I can keep moving until I get an instant card I can pay for, or if I get an instant card that I really, really want badly, and I can pick it up. That doesn't end my movement by picking up these instant cards. I can pick up as many as I can afford, as many as I want, as long as I'm willing to keep spending those movement points, spending those action points, moving across all those tiles, and consistently drawing those incident cards. The movement step is also where you can try to claim some of these quest cards. Now remember, there's always three quest cards face up. There's only 11 quest cards in the game, and remember, the first person to complete three quests 
and perform one last action is going to be the grand winner of the game. That is one of the victory conditions. Now every single one of these quests, and you're allowed to only complete one quest per turn, unlike the incident cards which you can claim as many as you can pay for, quest cards you're only allowed to complete one quest per turn. Now to complete a quest, every single quest is going to have a certain amount of resources that you have to permanently discard to pay for this quest. So that does mean that if some of these quests that require you to spend some of your faction or some of your fame to gain access and gain these quests, that does mean that you do have to spend that fame and that fortune and that can make it a little more difficult for you to win from some of the other victory conditions. But that's something you have to judge if it's worth it for you when you're trying to complete some of these quests. One other thing that some of these quests that require you to spend your fame, you can't go into the negatives in the fame and negatives is the red dial which is basically mean you have your black list. So if I'm currently playing Garcia and I currently have a positive two fame which means I'm looking good with the Golden City and I want to complete this quest right here which requires me to spend three favor, I can't complete that quest because that would actually put me at negative one and you can never go into the negatives when using your fame to pay for quests. But if I happen to have three fame right here and I also happen to have three blue resources and I've also managed to ransack three buildings, I can discard all three of those things, move my resource dial all the way down to zero for my fame and then I can complete this quest and again you're only allowed to complete one quest per turn. Now some quests are also going to require you to spend some of your skill points to do it. And remember your skill points can never go below zero. Just like your fame, you can't go negative to spend favor to complete some of these quests. And the different resources you're going to have to spend for these quests are some of the different resources that you can get from the resource bag. You may have to discard some of these incident cards. You may have to discard some of these buildings that you ransacked. You may also have to discard some of your personal equipment that you've already built. But every one of these quest cards is going to tell you how many of each item you need to discard what you need to discard, and if you discard all those resources, you complete the quest, and any time a quest is completed, it's going to be immediately replaced, so there's always three quests available for every single player at the start of their turn. But remember, if you're the first person to complete three quests, that is a victory condition, and that will allow you to win the game. Now, the game wouldn't be called Raid and Trade without doing lots of raiding, so let's go ahead and explain the raid action now. Now remember, you can do a move action and then any one of the four actions. So if you decide to raid, you can't do combat. If you decide to do combat, you can't do trade, etc. You basically get to pick one of the four actions. That's going to be the action you're going to perform on your turn. Now every single one of the actions in the game is going to cost you a various amount of action points to complete. So let's go and start with raiding right now and describe exactly how the raiding works. Every single one of these buildings has a certain amount of action points that's going to cost you to go ahead and raid that building. The small buildings, the green buildings, cost you six actions to raid them. The yellow buildings, the medium buildings, cost you eight action points to raid them. And finally, the large buildings, the red buildings, they are the ones that are going to cost you ten action points to raid them. And to raid one of these buildings, all you have to do is just move in front of one of these buildings. Again, if you're not crossing a barrier or leaving the tile, it's not going to cost you any movement points to actually move in front of that building. You just simply move your manager in front of whichever building you want to choose to raid, and then you're going to draw the card based on whatever color of building you're deciding to raid. If I move in front of the small building right here, I'm going to take that token if I have the six action points available, and I'm going to draw one of the small building cards. If I move in front of the medium building right here, I'm going to spend the eight action points rotating my dial, and I'm going to draw a medium card, and finally if I move in front of a red building, no matter how much movement points I need to spend to get in front of it, I'll spend the movement points. And then I'm going to spend 10 action points and draw one of the red cards to go ahead and raid that red building. Every time you raid a building, one of two things are going to happen. Either the building is going to be unprotected or the building is going to be protected when you raid that building. And the way you're going to tell the difference is because you're going to flip over one of these cards and it's either going to have one of these, this dice pattern on it, which is going to tell you to roll this dice, which means nobody caught you in your raid, meaning your faction with the Golden City is not potentially going to go down. So we happen to be in front of this yellow city right, this yellow building right here, and we flip over this card right here with a die symbol on it. We can easily raid this building and nobody's going to catch us in the act. We don't need to worry about our fame or our fortune and our reputation with the Golden City going down. But unfortunately, some of these cards, when we flip them over, they're going to have this blacklist symbol on them, which is a skull with a number on top of it. And this is where we need to make a decision. Sure, we can go ahead and raid this building, but as soon as we do, we're going to lose the amount of favor of the Golden City based on the number on top of the skull. And that's going to be a direct hit onto our fame. And we've got to be careful if our fame takes too many hits, we're going to lose the ability to start raiding some of these buildings. And I'll explain that in just a moment. So we need to make a decision. If it's just the dice roll right here, let's happily roll the die. 
And if we roll a star result, we're going to gain the upper resources, the better resources. And we can also use the special ability of this card. If we don't roll the star, we're going to get the lesser resources and we don't get to use the special ability of this card. And this card is simply going to be discarded and we're going to grab that many resources from the resource bag. It's basically going to be a blind draw. So if I roll the star right here, I could draw out six resources out of the bag and they're going to go in my personal stash. And then I can use a special ability of the card right here, which most likely you're probably going to want to do, but not always. And then if I fail my roll, if I don't roll the star, I'm going to get only four resources and then I don't get to use this part of the card unless it tells me to do so if I fail my roll and some of the cards will tell you to do so. But if you happen to have some of these locations that have the bad hit on your reputation, you're not going to roll the die at all and look for a result. You're basically going to have to make a decision at this point. If you decide to raid this building, you're still going to take the raid token showing that you raid the building. And you also take the raid token if you decide to do the die roll. It's still going to go in your personal supply and you can use these to pay for quests. But if you decide to raid one of these buildings right here that have the blacklist hit, you're going to take the hit on your reputation. Then you're simply going to draw all the resources out of the bag based on the numbers can be right here. Then you're going to do what the card says right here if you want to. And it's usually going to give you an option to take some more hits on your fame for some even more better results. So it's kind of a juggling act. You want to keep taking hits on the fame, which is not going to be a good thing because your fame gets too low. You're going to lose the ability to start raiding some of these buildings. Or what you can decide to do is if you have the skull, you can decide that I'm not going to raid the building. The building is simply going to remain on the board and then this card is going to be put back on the bottom, potentially coming back up on a later turn. And then instead of losing fame, you're going to gain the amount of fame that you would have lost if you had raided that building. So that's kind of the decision you have to make. Do you want to keep gaining the fame hits and keep raiding those buildings while you're being watched by this golden city? Or do you want to show them what a wonderful person you are and just thematically keep on walking by and decide not to raid that building? But the problem is if you don't raid the building, you've still lost the action points for taking the raid action, putting you behind the other players, and you're also losing out on all these wonderful resources that you need to build your inventions, to pay for these quests, and do various other things across the board. The next action we can do on our turn is we can perform combat, and this is a good way for us to start re stealing resources from the other players. To perform a combat with another player, you need to be able to reach them without spending any of your movement points at all. So obviously you can't perform combat with somebody who was on a different tile than you, but you also can't perform combat with somebody who happens to be across a barricade because you can't spend any movement points to perform a combat. Of course, you could decide to do move before you do the combat, spend one movement point and move into the same location with the other player. But again, you need to do that and then once you've done that, you finish your move. You couldn't, for example, move, fight, and then decide to move away and retreat to fight another day. You simply must be within a certain tile, we must be on the same tile as your target, and you can't spend movement points in an effort to get within combat with them. Once you decide that you're going to go into combat with somebody, you need to have a gun resource, which is one of the gray resource cubes. If you happen to have one of the gray resource cubes, you're simply going to discard that gray resource cube, put it back in the bag, and all spent resources, every time they're spent, always go back in the bag, which means somebody else can potentially draw one of those resource cubes. Uh, resource tokens, sorry. But after you spend the resource token, you need to spend five action points by moving your dial down, and then the, your opponent needs to make a decision. First of all, they need to figure out if they happen to have a gray resource token also. If they don't have any gray resource tokens, they cannot defend themselves at all, and they're basically going to have to suffer the consequences of the combat. If they do have a gray resource token, and if they decide to discard that gray resource token, and finally, if they also spend three action points, they can go ahead and defend themselves. And the way combat is going to work is every single player is going to roll their personal die. So the green player is going to roll their green die. And the blue player in this example is going to roll their blue die. And basically, the player is going to be looking for the results on their die roll. The attacker is going to look for the results that are going to be in the white. The defender is going to look for the results that's going to be in the gray. And every single player on their player board tells you exactly what results are going to happen when they roll whatever they roll. For example, if you have Carter, every time he rolls a symbol that looks like a biohazard, he automatically wins the combat no matter what his opponent rolls on their die. Now his opponent may still get extra bonuses because some of these players have extra bonuses and when they roll things on their dice, but he's still going to win the combat. Or if you happen to roll the power symbol, that means you're only going to win the combat if your opponent does not roll one of the defense, one of the shield symbols. After you figure out what results you're going to get from your dice, dice from the different symbols from rolling the dice, players are going to figure out who wins the combat. 
Now, if the attacker wins the combat, basically looking at all the results of all the dice rolls for all of our players, the attacker can make the defender make one of two decisions. Now it's up to the defender to decide what they want to do. The defender either has to give the attacker three resources of the attacker's choice, or the defender has to give the attacker five resources of the defender's choice. So it's either five that I choose if I lose, or three that the attacker wants if they win. So you need to figure out exactly what you want to do, but that's exactly how combat is resolved in Raid and Trade. The next action a player can do is they can go ahead and craft one of their special devices that only they're allowed to craft. Now I do say that with one caveat because there is one player who can steal inventions from other players, but let's not get into that really quick, that's just a minor segue. But basically what you need to do is if you want to decide that you want to craft one of your inventions, you basically need to spend some resources, and then you're going to get a permanent gain on your skills, but again you can spend those skill gains to go ahead and complete quests, or you can use those skill gains to try to win the game. Basically, every single invention that you can create in the game is going to have a cost and resources. And these are going to be color coded. It's going to tell you how many of these resources you need to discard to go ahead and complete that invention. So, for example, if Carter wants to create his helmet, he needs to discard one yellow resource if he happens to have it. And he also needs to discard one orange resource. If he can discard both of these, he can go ahead and create the helmet. And again, both of these are going to go back in the bag of spent resources. As soon as he creates the helmet, he's going to add that to his table showing him that he has a one-time use of the helmet. It's going to give him one special ability that he can basically discard this for. And when these are discarded and used, they are removed from the game. Remember, you don't get them back to try to build them again. That's why you get a couple different copies of every one of these inventions because once you build them, they become one-time use inventions. And once you spend these and use them, they're discarded and removed from the game. But every one of these inventions is also going to give you amount of skill points anywhere from one to three additional skill points. And as soon as you build it, you're basically going to raise your skill dial up by that many points, bringing you that one step closer to winning the game. Remember, the first person who gets 20 skill points is potentially able to win the game. But there's one other victory condition. I'll explain that to you when I'm explaining the very end of this tutorial here. So after a player has decided to create this item and spent the resources, again, it becomes a built item that they can use at any time, even immediately after it's built, for whatever result it gives you at the bottom. And once it's used, if it has that fireball symbol, it is fully removed from the game. The final action you can do is the trade action, which is the final half of the title of the game for Raid and Trade. To do a trade action, you have to be the active player, and then you pick any other player who's playing the game, and you ask them if they want to make a trade. Now, any one of these resources can be traded between the players, and you basically need to make a decision of what kind of resources you want to accept in the trade. Now the other player doesn't have to accept the trade, and if they don't accept the trade, then you don't have to spend the single action point that it costs to do a trade. If you both can come to an amiable decision on your trade though, each player will have to spend one action point to signify that they have completed the trade. Now there's one minor caveat to this, and that happens to be the player of Garcia. Now the player of Garcia, he is the master trader in the game, and it's his one special ability. Anytime he performs a trade with any player, and it doesn't matter who he performs a trade with, whether he's the active player picking another player to trade with, or the active player picks him to make the trade with, as long as he's involved in the trade, neither player has to spend an action point to perform the trade. Whether the trade is accepted or not, neither player is going to perform or spend the action points. But if Garcia is not involved with the trade, then every player involved in the trade has to spend one action point to complete the trade. Now players are free to trade any amount of resources they want and they're also free to trade any item cards that they want between them whether the item has been built or whether the item has not been built. Again, that's up to them. But again, the players have to come to a mutual decision that they want to accept the trade. If the players don't accept the trade, the action points aren't spent and the action's pretty much done. There's one other thing you can do with the trade though. You can also trade with the black market in the center square. Now to do so, you have to actually be located on the center square and if you want to do so, you simply spend one action point to initiate the trade with a black market. Then you discard any four resources that you have in your hand. It doesn't matter which four resources you discard. And for every four resources you discard, you can take one of the available resources that are available in the black market and take it out of the supply. Which basically means you get to reach in the bag and dig out and get the specific item or resource that you specifically need. It's not a random drop from the bag. So for example, if I happen to need food, because food can be burned to get action points at any time you want, I can simply go over here to the center tile, discard three resources of any kind, put them back in the bag, then reach inside the bag, 
pull out one food resource and now I have that food resource to add as my resource that I can spend at a later date. Now again, remember food is very nice because food can be discarded for action points and it can also be used for other things like food can be used to complete these encounter cards and various other uses. Now there's one other building that players can interact with and that happens to be the outpost. Now when players interact with the outpost, they're actually not going to pick up the token. It's not a resource like these other rated buildings that players can discard at a later date to pay for quests or other things like that. Basically, if you want to go visit the outpost, you need to spend a certain amount of action points to enter the outpost, and that is considered your movement, so you can't move into the outpost, interact with it, and then spend more movement points to move out. You basically have to spend five action points to move into the outpost, and then once you're inside the outpost, and only one person is allowed in the outpost at a time, unless one of the global event cards is in play that breaks that rule, and there is a global event card that does break that rule, but once you're inside the outpost, what you can do is you can spend eight action points to take one of these credit discs. Now these credit discs are worth anywhere from two to four credits and these credit discs are going to give you temporary favor with the golden city. So if you happen to claim the level four credit disc, that's going to give you four favor points with the golden city, moving you towards the positive, happy, positive faction with the golden city. Sorry about that. But the trick here is with these faction discs, you have to be very, very careful because players can actually steal them from you with combats. So when players go into combat from you, they can force you to give up your credit disc or they can force you to give up resources. And that's the choice of the attacker, not the choice of the defender. And when you lose this credit disc, even though you gain four when you gain the credit disc, once you lose the credit disc, you're going to lose all those resources. Now there's only five of these credit discs in the game and they're worth anywhere from two to four credits. But if you don't want to risk having those credit discs taken from you instead of paying eight action points, you can spend 10 action points, even though there's no credit discs left in the game. You can spend those 10 action points to permanently gain two favor points with the Golden City. And that's a permanent adjustment that cannot be taken from other players. But it can also be lost by going into the blacklist by doing some raids or other things that can cause your faction to go down with the Golden City. Now I did say only one player at a time is allowed in the outpost and you have to be very, very careful. Because if another player comes along on their turn and decides to attack you because you're inside the outpost and they want to be inside there, they can spend seven action points to go ahead and shoot you, force you out of the outpost, force you to lose three of your resources that you happen to have. And matter of fact, they don't even make the die roll do that. They immediately get the move in and then they can start interacting with the outpost. The trick is though, if you attack another player who's currently inside the outpost, because the outpost is allied with the Golden City, Attacking the outpost does cause you to lose three favor immediately with the Golden City. That's basically the entire game of Raid and Trade. Players are going to continue going around the map, trying to raid these buildings, trying to gain the resources, attacking each other, making trades with the black market in an effort to either complete three quests, get to a 20 skill level, or get their fame all the way up to level 10, proving that they're a paragon that's worth entry into the Golden City. There's one small caveat to this, though, to actually pull the victory in the game. As soon as you get to either level 20 on your skill, or if you get to level 10 on your fame, or as soon as you spend and complete that third quest, you are required to spend 20 action points to actually win the game. Now, if you don't have the 20 action points available to win the game, you're gonna have to wait till the next turn because at the start of every single round, every single player starts with 15 action points at the start of every single round. But again, that's not quite 20 action points to win the game. So this is where food comes in handy, because remember, every food you discard gives you one action point. Additionally, every single player has a whole bunch of inventions they can build that they can discard for three action points immediately. And also, some of the players have dice rolls they can get that'll give them action points, and there's various other ways. But remember, to win the game, you have to have three quests completed, or have 20 skill, or have level 10 on the fame, and also have 20 action points to spend as soon as you do so, you immediately win the game. Now that's the complete game of Raid and Trade. I hope you enjoy this tutorial video for the game of Raid and Trade. If you have any comments or questions, please leave them in the YouTube comments down below. You can also feel free to email me at off the shelf board game reviews. That's otsbgr at gmail.com. As always, thanks for subscribing and thanks for watching.